You're listening to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast presented by Krauss Health, the exclusive healthcare partner of Syracuse Athletics. Well, welcome back to another edition of the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. And today I'm joined by a guy that if you don't know who he is or what he does, if you're a basketball fan, you need to learn real quick. Uh, Chris <laughs> Dorch, <laughs> uh, who is, uh, how did you, how did you describe yourself earlier? Uh, Lord and purveyor of the. <laughs> <laughs> I know um, I was saying, I try not to be the Lord and purveyor. I, I like to rely on my members of the of U.S. Basketball Writers Hall of Fame, like yourself, to uh, uh, to inform my opinions. Well, <laughs> I am editor and publisher. <laughs> editor and publisher of the Bible of college basketball. It's the Blue Ribbon Basketball Yearbook. Um, this year, Blue Ribbon comes out in its 44th edition, a number that Syracuse fans will like. Uh, they and, and uh, Chris, uh, does, you just do a magnificent job year in and year out on Blue Ribbon. It is the most comprehensive uh, preview. I can't even call it a magazine. It's an annual. Yeah, um, yeah it would kill a small a animal if, if it fell on one. Yeah, I've my wife and I've used it actually for such. A, <laughs> a, a, um, but and this year, I mean, you always the, the previews are amazing. They're so comprehensive. They're so in depth. Um, you have a small army of writers that go out and do these previews. And this year you made sure every single division one team has a preview in, in the blue ribbon. That's right. Um, we finally, for years, I was of the opinion that if the NCAA was not going to allow a transitioning team into the tournament or even count its stats, I remember one year a transitioning team's player had led the nation in steals but not in the eyes of the NCAA. Boy, was he hot about that. But now, you know, and and you've got one in your area, LeMoyne. So uh, uh, West Georgia is in the book. So what I'm telling people, and and uh, with, with nary a bit of hyperbole, is that this is the most comprehensive college basketball preview book in the history of college basketball. And... I'm kind of joking, but I'm kind of not. Uh, you remember as kids. Yeah, because I guarantee right now I haven't done it yet. I have downloaded my version of this year's yearbook. But now yeah. I know I can probably go find out as much about West Georgia's backup guard uh, yeah. as I can the backup guard at Wake, Wake Forest, or somebody else. Because the, the previews are just amazing. And I, I always tell yeah. Sir, uh, anybody, Syracuse fans or any fans, if you really want to have some fun, if you really want to know about college basketball, get Blue Ribbon because early in the season, especially when your favorite team is playing a lot of non-conference games and teams you're not very familiar with, you can go in, get your Blue Ribbon, and you can find out everything you want about Youngstown State, LeMoyne, West Georgia, whoever, yeah. right? And yeah. it's, it's a great book. And I don't know how you don't go cross-eyed uh, writing and editing all the previews you do. It's it's kind of nuts, Mike. Um, I a, After every book is over, I think to myself, how in the heck did I do that? Uh, last night, one of my editors said, uh, we were texting, and, and he said, I can't fathom that you read every story. So that, that piqued our curiosity. So we started counting and counting and counting. This book, has more than 850,000 words. And uh, like I said, every preview, every team in the country is previewed. And you and I as kids, we couldn't wait for Street and Smith to come out. I'll never forget haunting the Barnes and Noble or the Kroger's or wherever to get my Street and Smith. And I never would have dreamed. I knew I wanted to be a sports writer and I knew I wanted to cover basketball, but I never would have dreamed that I would be a part of something that people – anticipate as much as I did anticipating Street and Smith. And I mean, people call and tell me this is their Christmas. The season can't start without Blue Ribbon, coaches, uh, NBA scouts, all the – Fran Fraschilla, I, I send him one every year, Seth Greenberg, and you'd think I'd sent them the keys to a new Beamer or something. Uh, they're just <laughs> thrilled to get it. Jimmy Dykes, who does a lot of – SEC for uh, ESPN, he always asked early if I'll send him the SEC stuff, which is mostly what I write. 
and I send it to him early and he always buys a book too. He doesn't have to, I'd probably give him one, but if he's going to pay, I'll, I'll take it. But I do send him the SEC stuff for free and he studies it. I mean, guys like him, Fran Fischilla, I really admire them because they, they take uh, a coaching approach to, to television coverage. And you really learn a lot when you, when you uh, listen to those guys, and I'm flattered that that their that their first step in 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 their season prep is to read our book, and I say our because you're a member of it too. A small hand in it. Thank you very much. It's always a, a privilege to to be able to contribute to Blue Ribbon. Before we go any further, if we've piqued anybody's interest out there who's listening in, BlueRibbonYearbook.com is the place to go to either order a hard bound or spiral bound version of it, or you can uh, get it right now, actually uh, the yeah. digital version of blue ribbon, this year's blue ribbon it's it's available already. Um, so you can start doing your basketball prep. If you're a fan out there by going to blue ribbon uh, and, and ordering it now. And there's also a special deal if you want to combine, which is what I did, by the way, I, yep. I combined my digital version with the spiral bound and I got a discount. Yeah, it, uh, we've we've got the digital, as you said. It's downloadable. It has been since last Thursday. Our book is still at the printer, but they promised delivery by September. They they promised they'll ship by September twenty fourth. So, for us, it's an all time early date. To get there, we had to do one thing that I didn't want to do, but I haven't gotten many complaints. We had to stop publishing schedules because, as you know, Mike, uh, it's getting later and later into the year. And after COVID, the book industry just boomed and, and printers all over the country got bombarded. And I realized then that if I don't get my book to the printer as early as possible, it may be Christmas till it comes out. And so I can't wait for schedules anymore. I, I can't wait for schools that share buildings with the NBA to, to sort that out. And I can't wait on ESPN to decide who they want to play you know, in the Maui or, well, Maui's are always preordained, but I can't wait for these uh, uh, intersectional matchups. Uh, and so I just don't put schedules in anymore, but you know what it has done? It's gotten us over that 800,000 mark in copy. So if you're a reader and you and I talked before your show, as we both are, uh, this is the place for you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I don't want to give away too much of, of the yearbook, um, but still, I, I, we do want to talk a little bit about a portion of it that's in, um, of interest to Syracuse fans. Because yes. uh, I think if we talk a little bit about some of this stuff, I think there's some people might want to go and get this yearbook and see check the rest of it out. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask you, you do the predictions for every league. Right. When you're getting leagues now, like the ACC that are just so engorged, so so large. Yeah. You know, ACC is up to 18 teams now. How do you go about trying to put together a realistic prediction for the league, the, for the final league standings? It, it's extremely difficult. And, and I don't, uh, I don't get in the way of, I, I assign a captain for, for every league to make the predictions based on what the other writers think. And I don't generally overrule them. And, and as I look now and I see Syracuse at number 12 and having, you know, read your story and, and done a lot of extra homework for your show, I think 12 is too low. But having said that, it, it, it's not like it used to be. If it was a 12-team league and we picked them 12, maybe you're in a little bit of trouble. But 12 could easily be eight. And if you're eight, you're in the NCAA tournament. And that's all you want is a chance. i give you an example. I'm the captain for SEC. So we picked eight teams in our, in our preseason top 25 from the Southeastern Conference. Now, keep in mind, they added Texas and Oklahoma, and Texas was one of them. Ole Miss and Mississippi State are going to be in the NCAA tournament, but they're like ninth and tenth in the league. 
And and fans might look at that and say, well, they don't think very much of us. That couldn't be farther from the truth. And, and, and you know, again, this is a Syracuse show, so I would say that after I really poured into Syracuse, I believe that Syracuse had one of the most effective portal classes in the entire country. And wow. so – uh, so, and, and I look at this, remember, I told you before the show, I grew up as a kid. Uh, I was a fan of the transactions that you saw in the agate type and scoreboard because roster construction and personnel moves. I don't know. I love the winter meetings when I was a huge baseball fan. I sort of had to give that up, but uh, yeah, roster building is important to me. So a lot of fans will call just to talk to me and I encourage it. I like it. And they ask me about the NIL and they ask me about the portal. And, I, and I'll say, look, that's not a problem for me because I, uh, I am interested in, in how rosters are constructed and what the different philosophies are. Like Syracuse had specific holes to fill, okay? But one – coach of of a solid mid-major league, although it's a one-bid league. He actually won the regular season. I won't identify him because of what I'm about to tell you he said. He said, we went after B-list players. So I kind of probed him a little bit because, you know, you and I are from the era when, when B-list meant subpar, like a B-movie. Or, I knew he didn't mean that. And, and he said, well, I kept prodding him because I try to be fair when I interview coaches or anybody, really. I want them to tell me what they really mean. And yeah. after a little bit of conversation, he finally said, this doesn't sound sexy, but we went after functional players. And by functional, he meant they were D1 starters, but they were probably the fourth or fifth option on their team. But he said, we were looking for guys who were willing to fit into a team concept, and that's good enough for us. Now, on the other hand, Syracuse needed another big. Syracuse needed a point guard, and I think they filled those needs beautifully. They needed shooting. I think they found an underrated shooter and a great athlete. So uh, I think Syracuse filled their needs from the portal you know, I don't want to rank them, but but certainly after I've read 364 teams and have a basic recollection, I don't know of many teams that needed a certain position filled and went out and got it better than what Syracuse did, if that makes sense. You're referring to that position. You probably ref you mean the center where Syracuse brought in Eddie Lampkin. Uh, specifically center, but also uh, Jake Juan Carlos at the point. Uh, you know, uh, I know Tad Boyle. We're, we're friends from back when he was an assistant in Tennessee. And uh, th that gig for me, by the way, I know you've covered the beat for so many years. And, and by the way, uh, uh, Syracuse fans are so lucky to have you and Donna uh, on that beat. Two Hall of Famers who uh, are fair and accurate and and uh, can can tell you the honest truth and write well. People just don't know how fortunate they are to have not one but two Hall of Famers on one beat. So I wanted to say that before I forgot it. But uh, being on that Tennessee beat allowed me to make friends with coaches who at the time were on the low end of the rung of the ladder, and now they're head coaches. So I I know I know uh, Tad Boyle, and I've known him for years, and. That team had three NBA draft picks, yet Eddie Lampkin averaged 10 and 7 and shot 58% from the field. But just as important, and I know you you quoted Coach Autry, he says, I think people are going to be surprised by Eddie. He's not what people think he is. And, okay, so you look at the basics. Let's, let's look at uh, basic analytics. 88% of his shots were at the rim, and he shot 61% there. So you think, okay, he's just this big, hulking dude. Well, he also averaged 2.2 assists. Yeah. And if, if you look at tape on him, 
Tad utilized him from the high post and the mid post as a passer. And he would be almost like a 300 pound point guard. And he has amazing vision. And plus at 611, if somebody, if a smaller defender has switched off of you, you're going to be able to see over them and he could get the ball to cutters. So that's what Coach Autry meant when he said he's not what people think he is. He can dribble. He's active. So, uh, so okay, big hole fill, right? So let's go mm-hmm. to point guard where, where, where they lost Mint. And let's go to a, a team that gets raped every year by upper majors, Hofstra. You know, uh, uh, Alabama had great success with a Hofstra guard last year. Jacon Carlos, I was doing my homework for this show, and I found an old video when he was 15 years old, and the video was entitled, Is He the Best Passer in New York City? And I got to looking at him. Uh, he finished 14th in D1 and assists, as, as I think you mentioned uh, in your story. Uh, but his assist rate, and I, you can teach an old dog new tricks because I've, I've come to be, be a fan of advanced metrics. His assist rate was 30%. And, yeah, he averaged almost three turnovers a game. I think Coach Autry would want to cut down on that. But he's such a skilled passer. He reminded me immediately of a young Steph Curry. Now, I was was fortunate because I, until last semester, taught at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And when Steph was at Davidson, he he, – I got to see a lot of his games. And somebody asked me the other day on Twitter, it was after the Olympics, did you know he was going to be this special? And I said, well, I knew he was special, but I didn't know he would be that special as a shooter. I thought his specialty was passing because he had an amazing ability to look up the floor and almost like you're playing chess and you're a move ahead of your opponent. That's what this kid, Jake Juan Carlos, does. And he looks up the floor constantly. So uh, as Coach Autry said in your story, you quoted him, he knows how to get people the ball. Everybody wants to play with him. He gets people the ball. So that's a guy who, you know, and and it it used to be where I think pre-portal, it was kind of a crapshoot maybe where – Hey, can this kid's skills translate uh, to a, a another level of of D one? So you know, I took the liberty of of looking that up too, and uh, he had a ten point nine assist game against Duke. Uh, you know, he flirted with a tr- real close to a triple double twice. So uh, he's an amazing rebounder at six feet, an incredible passer. Uh, he shoots the ball, what I consider green light range, uh, percentage from three to me, if you can make 33% of your three pointers, that's green light for me. He he shot 34% last year, but what he can really do is he can score in the mid range. And if you're at a school like Alabama, uh, that's taboo. Uh, unless you're a guy uh, that that can make those shots, like uh, uh, he he had a, a Hofstra transfer last year that was so good at making those shots. So evidently, Speedy teaches that at, at Hofstra. So what Carlos can do, he can get to the elbows and make shots, and he can get into the lane and shoot floaters over bigger. So I, I've talked at length with coaches. Rick Bird of Belmont is a, a good friend of mine, a fellow music lover, uh, but he hates. His teams were always last in the country in percentage of mid-range shots taken. It was taboo with him. And he just thought that was a blockable shot. And I don't think so if you're as quick as Jaquan Carlos, Carlos and you can stop on a dime and shoot it from the elbow. Or if you can learn to shoot a floater uh, with accuracy and consistency and height. So uh, – I love those two kids, and I also love Lucas Taylor. Uh, he shot 54 well, about Lucas Taylor, because I think yeah. he was the guy you were referring to at the very beginning of our conversation when you talked about Syracuse adding an elite shooter. Yeah, he's he's elite. 
Uh, hmm. and, and it came late. Here's what I was, the, the point I was going to make earlier, which I sidetracked myself. Nowadays, with the double transfer, it's not as difficult to determine whether a kid can can uh, move up because chances are he started. Uh, Tennessee's got a kid that went to Iowa State, Hofstra, and now he's back at upper level. And so uh, this kid, Lucas Taylor, started out at Wake Forest. So that means that tells you right away, a, another good friend of mine who I knew – Got to know as an assistant in Tennessee, Steve Forbes, one of the best ever, captain of the all lobby team at the Final Four. Uh, uh, but but he 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 treasures three point shooters. So he, if he starts out at Wake, that tells me okay, Steve Forbes thinks he can shoot it from three. Uh, then he goes to Georgia State and he proves it. Uh, he hits sixty four of them, and then I start looking at film on the guy and you know he too can shoot from the mid-range and he can punch it also he's super athletic as you quoted coach Autry saying he's one of the best athletes on our team he can give you a little pump fake ball fake and he's gone and the thing about it is because he's a green light three-point shooter you have to respect him and if you if, if if somebody throws it to him and he's got a clear catch and shoot, somebody has to close out in a hurry. And if he just gives one little left, right ball fake, he's gone and he's going to punch it. So, so uh, he's not just a, a three point shooter. And, and I still think in the college game, six, five, a six, five wing is good positional size. It, it isn't in the NBA anymore. But I think he's got good positional size with exceptional athleticism. I love the kid. And then uh, Chance Westry, I've never seen him. But, I, again, uh, Bruce Pearl, got to know him when I covered Tennessee. And I, I've, I've talked to Bruce about him. Uh, he's a talented kid who's never gotten a chance. He hurt right. his knee uh, 11 games into his freshman year. He was expected uh, to play a key role last year and, and hurt his other knee. It's it's amazing how unlucky certain kids are. This kid, Steel Venters at Gonzaga, he was supposed right. to be uh, their Dalton Connect, but he tears his ACL. And this year, he comes back healthy, shooting the ball. Their coach has told us uh, he was shooting the fire out of it. And, and, and then he tears his Achilles. Which, as you know, you've covered these. That's a worse injury yes. than an ACL. It's a, it's at least a year, so you just can't buy a break. And I think that's the case with Westry. Bruce told me the kid can play. So, uh, if Bruce Pearl wanted him on his roster, that's a good get if he's healthy. So that's why I say, you know, you you look at the needs that that Coach Autry and his staff determined. And they went out and they found – they didn't just find guys who who had numbers. They found guys who, who had a, a history of playing uh, in a team concept and a history of being uh, adept at ball skills. And, and it even goes back, like I said, back to the big guy. I mean, he's a 300-pound point guard. He really is. And and Jay Con Carlos, when somebody says, "Are you the best passer in New York City when you're 15?" Uh, that gets my attention. So I think yeah. Syracuse has filled their needs. I mean, you can debate. You can look on 247sports.com and they rate they rate recruiting classes, portal classes. You can debate those endlessly. What I try to do, and this is. This is what I think my experience brings, uh, my love of basketball, uh, my nerdishness about basketball. I had to give up everything else in favor of basketball. Uh, I used to be an all-sports lover. NFL, would watch every PGA Tour event, uh, NBA. But when I became 
a quote unquote expert, I knew that everything had to go and I had to devote my life to it. So when it, when it's all said and done, and, and I like to use this analogy, one of my good friends, Les Robinson, uh, he was a coach at NC State, ETSU, the Citadel. He was on the selection committee one, well, whatever rotation, however many years. And he told me when they get to the, the final, as he called it, nutcracking time, uh, what's, what do they do? And he says, they go around the room and they said, if you were a coach, who would you least like to play? So when it comes down to nutcracking time for us and somebody has made a decision on, on a ranking or if I have to make the decision, I go back and I read and I study and there's a great, there's a great YouTube channel. I don't know how they can get away with doing it for free. I, I guess if you get so many clicks, YouTube pays you money. But I would pay for it. But it it's, does nothing but go over transfers, highlights, uh, interspersed with synergy stats. And that is so invaluable. I mean, it was, it was why a Tennessee coach, I won't say who, called me last year and said, what do you really think about Dalton Connect? And this was uh, before they pulled the trigger. And I said, he's better than Grady Dick. And they said, what? And, and you do know he's predicted to be a lottery pick. I said, I don't care. I've watched enough tape. I've seen the analytics. I think he's better than Grady Dick. Now, he didn't go to the lottery. A uh, bunch of teams are going to be sorry they didn't. But he got lucky, and now he's playing with LeBron. Uh, and AD. So, uh, but what I'm saying is over the years, I've gotten to understand a player's skill set and how it impacts the team that he's going to. And okay, I knew yeah. that I, I could not have predicted. I'm, I'm not going to say I'm, I'm a genius or an oracle. I could not have predicted that this kid would go off for 40 uh, or, or high 30s every night. But we talk to his coach. We we don't just <laughs> we don't just pull stuff out of thin air. I have a guy who has covered the uh, the big sky for fifteen years. The coaches know him and trust him. And he called him and he and you know ordinarily most reporters would be afraid to call the coach where a kid just left you. But there was no animosity there. He graduated. He did what he was supposed to. And he wanted to try his game at a higher level. So the coach had no problem talking about him. He said, oh, yeah, he can get his shot off against anybody in D1. So I had that going for me. And and so, yeah, I, somebody, for example, and I, you, might, you might ask me about him on this show, Duke. I think Duke is way better than whatever people are ranking him, you know, Seven, eight, nine. I think I'm third. Three. Yeah, the third. Yeah, and, and I think they're way better than that. And I, I came to that conclusion after I read Patrick Stevens' story, and then I started to study who they had and how they fit. Everybody knows about Cooper Flag, but they they signed a, a, a five star center who's also going to be a lottery pick. Uh, he played in the Olympics uh, this summer with, with his native uh, country from Africa. He's yeah, going to be great. Sudan. Tall, thin kid. Exactly. Really yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 And, and so I think that uh, it, I've just – I've been around it long enough to, to try to see how pieces fit together. And I've also gotten interested in how coaches – what coaches' philosophies are in piecing together. Give you an example. South Alabama has three NAI, NAI players in its recruiting class. I bet that's the first time in history a D1 team went down and took three NAI players. But you got to get them from somewhere. Uh, yep. You know, you're getting plundered from others. Uh, you've one coach told me uh, he was a mid-major D uh, D1 coach said he felt bad about going to get D2 guys. But he said, they're taking them from me. <laughs> so I got to get over it. Uh, so. Sure for you, Chris. 
um, sorry to interrupt, but to go back to Syracuse and your 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 history analyzing teams and your experience, you know, Syracuse last year had a very young team. Uh, after losing Naheem McLeod 14 games into his injury, they basically were seven or eight sophomores. That's all they had was yeah. sophomores. They had no seniors on the roster at all. And then their only juniors were gone 14 games in, or that Benny Williams was dismissed from the team and Naheem McLeod got hurt. So it's it's all sophomores down the stretch. In adding the guys from the portal, one thing we haven't added, you mentioned about the, the portal guys and everything, because they lose a lot of those guys. Uh, Judah Mintz went pro, Quadir Copeland transferred, just Justin Taylor transferred, everyone's transferred. They bring in a grad student and three seniors in yep. those four transfers. That All of a sudden, I'm looking at Syracuse's roster, and it's grad student, seniors, J.J. Starling's a junior, Chris Bell's a junior, Kyle Cuff is now in his third or fourth year of college ball. Um, how much of a difference – can that kind of experience slash maturity make? Even if maybe the kid's profile isn't as flashy as maybe a younger player's? It's a great question, and it's, it's, it's proven year in and year out in the NCAA tournament where you see these bracket-busting teams, and they're all seniors, and they're playing a team that is far more talented uh, and you see these crazy first round ousters of Purdue and, and uh, Kansas and Duke. And how could it happen? It happens by maturity. And uh, I've talked to several coaches this year about how the portal, as crazy as it is, it actually gives you a chance to get old and stay old by cherry picking. Tennessee is a good example. They lost six guys to the portal, uh, including two who would have been starters. The four guys they signed out of the portal are way better than the guys they lost. And they're all experienced, way better than the guys they lost. And, and so I think they'll be better than they were even without Dalton Connect. Even their coaches don't agree with me on this. I think they're going to be. Uh, because I think they're going to be one of Rick Barnes's best defensive teams. And he's always in one, two, three, four, and, and Ken Palm's defensive efficiency metrics. So in answer to your great question, um, the maturity level, I mean, as, as we're talking here, I'm, I'm thinking, why did I let my guy get away with picking Syracuse 12? But we're going to be wrong. We're, we're going to be wrong. But, but as I said, though, it, it wouldn't have been as bad if the ACC was still, you know, 12 teams, whatever, 14 teams, 15 teams. Uh, but uh, it would have been worse then. But now Syracuse, if you if you pick somebody 8 through 12, that means you don't know what the heck, right? And so yeah, it's hard. Yeah, a, a twisted ankle – a missed block out in a key game and you can move up the standings four or five places. And, Absolutely and true. Yes. If, if you do that, then, then your seating in the tournament improves. And if your seating in the league tournament improves, you got a chance to make a little run. And if you got a chance to make a little run, although it doesn't matter as much as I think some pundits do, the, the, the selection committee is not oblivious to that. Uh, and, all of a sudden, you've got a team that was picked to finish 12th, might have finished 7th uh, because th their maturity stole them a couple of wins. Well, I think you had a stat in your story about how when they lost, they lost pretty big uh, last yes. year. A mm -hmm. And it was guys that were young and they weren't used to picking themselves up off the mat. All right. Uh, the players that they brought in, they're used to picking themselves up off the mat. And as I said, they're, they're, they all fit into a team format. They're all good passers. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be wrong on that prediction, and I'm glad of it because uh, it shows that nobody's infallible and not even us. I, I, as much as I'd like to be, and I go back there, 
Uh, but like I said, a minute difference separates 12 from six in a, in a league like that. I totally agree with you. Yes, I, I totally agree. It's only going to take a one game. Maybe, maybe you're lucky and you catch – a good team without his starting point guard for that one game where he has a turned ankle or yeah, uh, a backup center is hurt, which might not seem like a big deal, but if you're somebody misses a block an out and you trouble, get an offensive rebound and, and win the game, uh, people don't understand the minutia of not only the game in general as it's played season long, but advancing in the tournament. I mean, you've been with Syracuse enough to see you've covered uh, yes. the last Monday night. And, and and invariably, there's a rock fight game that they have to gut it through. Uh, there may be a game where best player on the other team twists his ankle or you get a, a call that goes in your favor or, like I said, you get a block out, the other team doesn't. Uh, stuff like that, it's really – they say football is a game of inches, but but basketball is a game of those little bitty uh, uh, circumstances that happen that go unnoticed, and they're not in the box score, and they're not widely written about, and they're not on the ESPN highlights, but they can affect your whole season. Yeah. And I just my love line, that about I, college basketball. I'm glad you basketball. brought that up, Chris. Yeah, because my, my, my line on that one is, and it's amazing you brought it up, I was football is a game of inches. I've always said basketball is a game of seconds. Yes. Those little minutia yes. plays and you never, you know, it's like a game can turn on, on, a, on a, on a, on a otherwise innocuous looking play. Um, right. And that's what makes it great. And that's why we love it. So. Exactly. And Chris, I, 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 I love having you on here. Uh, again, I love blue ribbon yearbook. It is an amazing resource. Again, I encourage people, I'm going to, you know, uh, pander here to you and, and and promote this thing without getting a dime from you for it. Uh, it's blueribbonyearbook.com. If anybody <laughs> wants to go check it out, uh, it's it, there is a downloadable digital version that's so handy, uh, but you can also get yourself your hard copy. Um, and Chris, uh, again, you mentioned it earlier. Congratulations to you because last April uh, you were inducted into the Basketball Writers uh, Basketball Writers Association Hall of Fame, along with my colleague at Syracuse.com, Donna DeTota. What an amazing induction class that was. Uh, I regret it, that it I was wasn't great. able to be there for both of you. Uh, she and I were the only two that were there. One, uh, uh, Terry Hutchins, was posthumous. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, another inductee, uh, Bob, uh, did not make it. So she and I were the only two that got to speak. And, and I think uh, there was another inductee who was inducted at the women's final four. So, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, and so uh, she and I were fortunate enough to to sort of have the stages to ourselves. There were other honorees, but uh, she gave That's a right. really heartfelt uh, and she was so grateful. And, and she she came from a time when it was difficult to be a female in our business. And, and uh, she had the guts uh, and the brains to stick it out. And then with me, I just thanked uh, my mentors and uh, I thank my parents for, for uh, instilling in me the gift of reading and writing. My dad was a writer, never went to college, but, but it, he was a great writer and, uh, and a great storyteller. And it turns out uh, our family for, for, years upon years going back we're, we're storytellers uh some verbal others with the written word but i guess that's just what i do and uh so very lucky i just wanted to be like you is all i wanted to be like mike <laughs> get, get in the hall of fame and, and i couldn't be more honored and proud uh to me it's a career capper sure. uh and and as i said syracuse fans You've got two of the best who ever did it in history covering that beat for you. Uh, when, when you get in our Hall of Fame, that takes in some ground. So consider yourselves lucky. <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying that. And uh, none of us take praise very well. So I'll just say thank you. Uh, and uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for uh, coming on the podcast, Chris. This was great. And 
uh, we'll have to have you back on again uh, sometime soon, maybe uh, maybe at some point during the, the coming season. And um, we, we can talk a little bit more basketball and kind of get an idea of, of where some of those uh, ACC predictions are headed. So, again, thank <laughs> yeah. you so much. Uh, thank you to everybody out there listening to the podcast. Again, this is the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast, and we'll see you again next time. Join us next time for the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast, presented by Krauss Health, the exclusive healthcare partner for Syracuse Athletics.